So I'm talking about uh, robust algorithms uh, in machine learning and, and elsewhere. It's more about robust algorithms than, uh, than machine learning, uh, which is all about throwing away information. My name is Tom Radcliffe. Uh, I, as, as many of the speakers uh, here today are, uh, am a physicist by education. I'm also a professional engineer, uh, which is a Canadian thing. Uh, I'm currently the vice president of engineering at Active State, uh, which I'll talk about in a little bit. My physics career and my engineering career have wandered around a lot, uh, including some very pure physics in, uh, in terrestrial neutrino physics, as well as something called the Sudbury Neutrino Observatory, uh, for which the, the head of the Snow Collaboration was awarded the Nobel Prize for his work uh, in proving that neutrinos have mass. The neutrinos are a subatomic particle uh, that are very important to the evolution of the universe, not very important to most practical things. I've also done a lot of work uh, in applied physics, in, in medical physics, image processing, uh, computer-assisted surgery, particularly for orthopedics, and have done a lot of work in data analysis for the biological sciences, particularly genomics, mostly looking at cancer genetics. Um, so my last academic position was an adjunct professor in pathology, uh, which is a weird place for a physicist to wind up. Uh, working on numerical analysis uh, for large quantitative biological data sets. People who went into biology and medicine, at least who are my age, didn't do so because they love math. And in the 90s, we started to produce these large numerical data sets in biology and medicine, and a lot of physicists wound up there because it's fun and it makes the world a better place, and there are some really hard problems. I had my own company, Predictive Pattern Software, and as I said, currently, I'm the Vice President of Engineering at Active State in Vancouver, Canada, which produces something called Active Python uh, that we've recently been enhancing for data, scientists, for, for, for data science, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, we're the open source languages company. Active State started back in 1997 to produce Perl on Windows when Perl on Windows was a really hard problem. It subsequently added Tickle and uh, Python distributions, did a whole bunch of other stuff. The company has been partially acquired uh, several times for technologies that has been developed, but the open source languages have always been the core of the business and providing enterprise support for open source languages in particular. We have banks and insurance companies, people like this for clients who need stable, curated, secure, up-to-date distributions of these various languages. In 2017, we've introduced uh, Active Go. It shipped uh, a month or two ago, and we are going to launch Active Ruby into beta this month, and there is more to come after that. We also uh, make a nice polyglot IDE that's optimized for dynamic languages called Komodo. It's a lot of fun. Uh, it's, there's, a, there's a free trial download. Uh, I recommend it, unless you're one of the 95% of developers who is already wedded to a particular IDE. It's a difficult market uh, to play in. So Active Python used to be a pretty vanilla distribution of Python. It was basically what you got with core Python, except up-to-date, curated, built for cross-platform. Uh, we have subsequently added about 300 additional packages, plus their dependencies, which comes into about 500 packages including a bunch of things that are selected specifically to aid with data science uh, and machine learning in one way or another. Keras, Theano, TensorFlow, Pandas. Uh, we heard in the keynote yesterday that there's always a complaint about uh, the Pandas interface. I personally love Pandas. Uh, I did a lot of work in R. R is a programming language you know, developed by and for statisticians. Uh, Pandas has tried to capture all of that good stuff that we get in R in a, in a Pythonic way. And I think it's a really beautiful tool. We don't have a third-party package manager. We've heard a lot about Conda uh, at this meeting. And uh, I think what it does, it does very well. Active State is very much about focusing on what the community is doing. Uh, PIP is not where it once was in terms of its capabilities. It's gaining capabilities all the time. And uh, if one wants to use PIP, or Conda for that matter, with uh, Active Python, that's a, that's a perfectly possible thing. And we're very cross-platform. Our community edition, which is downloadable for free for non-production use, 
uh, it supports Mac, Windows, and Linux, uh, but because we're an enterprise company, we also support uh, for our enterprise customers, AIX and HPOX and Solaris and, and things that hopefully no one in this room uh, is, is deeply engaged with uh, because they can be pretty interesting platforms to work on for modern uh, data science applications. The so ML libraries uh, we support, obviously, Keras is one of the big ones. I presume most people know about it. It uh, is a common front end to a whole bunch of really powerful back ends. Uh, Theano and TensorFlow are the big ones. We've just heard at this meeting, or I just heard at this meeting, that Microsoft has released uh, experimental support for CNTK uh, with Keras. This is really nice because it means that you can just be agnostic about what fundamental back end uh, you're using, and the Keras interface is really very nice. So it's accessible and, and great for rapid development, and I'll show a little example uh, later on. Theano uh, is not really an ML lib, but it has all the things you need to create uh, machine learning workflows, particularly evaluation of, of mathematical expressions that are very efficient, uh, and it's one of, the, one of the Keras backends. TensorFlow I'm not gonna talk about very much because I presume people know about that, uh, but Pandas, I just really want people to be excited about Pandas. Uh, it does have this R-like data frame, which is the best thing ever. If people have done data analysis in Python uh, in, in pre-Pandas days where you had to keep track of all the labels on all your data by hand, data frames do that for you. It also has really intelligent uh, indexing where you can take pieces uh, out of data frames based on numerical index, based on labels, and even on Boolean conditions. So you can, there's like, a, I'll, I'll show an example later where there's a one line thing uh, that just takes and creates a new data frame for, for a bunch of cases um, where a particular Boolean condition is true. It is, it is one of the things that makes data analysis in Python and data science in Python a real joy. So that's kind of some of the background on the tools I'm using, at least. Uh, but I really want to talk about robust algorithms. Uh, mostly, you know, I work with, with physical data of one kind or another, and all data has noise. We saw a nice example in the keynote earlier this afternoon where there was a data set that was supposed to be about juvenile uh, criminals or people who'd wound up in, a, in, a, in some kind of uh, uh, social services system in Maryland. And some of those individuals had ages that were 95, and some had ages that were zero, where people were entering data that was far outside of the, the actual applicable range. When you start computing statistics around that, having these wild outliers in the data can produce very significant distortions, which is why we do so much spend so much time cleaning things up. But no matter how good we get at cleaning things up, there's always stuff left over. And robust algorithms are intended to deal uh, with the inherent noise problems. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about examples of an actual problem, some algorithms uh, that are popular. One of the things that makes robust algorithms a little bit opaque is there are lots of them and they all have funny names that are not very informative. Uh, and it's not always clear why you should be using them or what you should be using them for. Uh, and then I'm, I'm gonna talk about the general approach of robustness and give a real world example of how one can use the idea of robustness without even necessarily focusing on a specific uh, named algorithm. The big thing about parametric algorithms, which are the things, the statistically speaking, a parametric algorithm uh, is generally one that assumes a distribution. That distribution is almost always a Gaussian. And uh, it uses all the information available. It uses the quantitative information in the, uh, in the data, the, 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 the cardinal values of the data. But those cardinals include noise as well as signal. And sometimes they include other populations of data uh, that can be badly distortive of the, um, the ultimate result that we're looking for. So as a physicist, I think about data in terms, in, in a couple of different ways. One is we have a physical process producing some signal, and we have a transducer that's producing ultimately a measurement, a digital value of some kind that includes both information about the world in the signal plus noise of some kind. And that noise is not always well behaved. 
It can be signal dependent. It can be time dependent. Uh, it can be episodic. Uh, it can be weird, basically. Uh, time dependent noise is a fun thing. If you do any work with transducers in a, a building environment, like this one, for example, you will see that everything becomes noisy at about eight in the morning because people are arriving at work and they're going up and down in elevators, which draw a great deal of power, which produce spikes on the power all over the building. So there are effects like that that bleed through into your data that you can't get away from. We also have uh, a different type of noise. I'm a nuclear physicist. We spend a lot of time measuring, uh, you know, when, you, when you're doing radiation spectroscopy, you're measuring events, basically, where a detector says, you know, a gamma ray came in, it had this much energy. And you have events from the sources that you care about, and you have events from the sources you don't care about, which may be real. They may be cosmic rays. They may be other forms of, of gamma radiation, or they may be electrical noise in the system. So you get a background signal that is completely different from the physical process that you really care about, that it can have any distribution whatsoever, and, and frequently does. So I'm going to give an example of a particular case that I've worked on without, it, 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 without worrying about where the, where the data comes from, of an automated test instrument for bacteria uh, in water, where there was a case in Canada where uh, an incompetent municipal operator killed a lot of people because there was a back, there was high le level of bacteria in the water that didn't get caught in testing. So there, there was significant government investment in producing better water testing that was automated and idiot proof. So this instrument was designed to be just completely fire and forget. You pour the water in, you stick the cartridge into the instrument, everything would work. That's a very highly constrained system from the point of view of engineering design. The input data quality cannot be made arbitrarily good. You have to sell it for an affordable price, which limits uh, what goes into it. And there's underlying physics, chemistry, and biology uh, that messes up the signal in various ways. So there was a certain level of badness in the data that we just had to live with. And this is very typical. When we talk about the Internet of Things, most of the data that comes in from various sensors is going to be affected by issues of this kind. The ideal data is, is this nice kind of sigmoidal curve, where it's a growth curve for some bacteria. And we're looking for, uh, when does it cross? <laughs> Looks pretty easy when you look at it like this. There's a little constraint where it has to be as fast as possible. We don't want to wait 24 hours if the threshold was crossed at you know, five hours, which is a heavily contaminated sample. And we want it to work under all circumstances. We want it to be very, very robust. And if we get it wrong, there is a potential you know, threat to uh, human health if, if we say, yeah, there's no problem. And there is one. And because of the nature of the growth process we're looking at, there is uh, an exponential sensitivity to errors in where the threshold is crossed. The real data looks a little more like this. It has some uh, signal-dependent noise, which is extremely common. So if you look at the baseline down low, you'll see that the noise is fairly small, but there's a much fatter curve up top because the more signal produces more noise. And there's also some threshold. Instruments rarely have true zeros. You're almost always sitting on top of some threshold, which is going to vary from instrument to instrument. And then, in fact, because of various issues with the engineering of the system, there are, in the real instruments, these step functions in the threshold level that change from time to time based on essentially random processes. It's related to buildup of pressure in one particular component due to gas evolved by some bacteria. So this becomes dependent on all kinds of extraneous issues that we have no control over. And that's just the simple stuff. When users, we, we, we looked over thousands and thousands of samples, pulled out a whole range of anomalies trying to produce a robust detector that wasn't going to be messed up by these things. So we saw different growth curves. We saw bacteria that got tired after a while. We saw bacteria with, with you know, sudden onset, all kinds of things, and accounted for as many of those as possible. But in deployment, this is a system that will run potentially 
uh, millions of tests per year. So one in a million chances are going to come up a lot. And this is something I think that we forget about when we talk about big data. It's like, wow, we have all this data. This is great. It means that really rare occurrences are going to be happening all the time in somebody's data stream. And that when we come to analyze that, we've got to be robust against those unexpected, that we can't realistically anticipate everything that can go wrong uh, simply because the scope of data is so much larger than what we can reasonably analyze. So that's just an example. And I'm not going to talk about how that particular problem uh, was solved, but we managed it. Um, and I just want to, but, but it makes the point that parametric algorithms are sensitive to all those weird effects. They're designed to use all the information that is coming in, including the pieces that don't contain information about the problem we care about. So they degrade badly in the presence of anomalies. And when we talk about moving from data science to data engineering in particular, we have got to have systems that are robust against all the strange things that are going to happen in our data streams. We've seen in a number of talks uh, over the last two days, people talking about the amount of time that data scientists spend cleaning up data. And I've done this myself, the 50% the or 80% of the time that we spend cleaning data. When it comes to deployment into the real world, uh, we don't have the opportunity to, to dig in and review the anomalies at that level. So automated cleaning, super important. We always are going to have to do stuff at, at that level, but we have to acknowledge that as data scientists, we generally deal with stuff that's more pristine than our poor algorithms will be facing when they go out into the real world. Robustifiers, or the notion of robustness, is fundamentally about replacing our quantitative data with something else. And ranking is a big one. I'll talk about a bunch of algorithms that use ranked data. So all we care, you know, we don't care about that this value is 1, that value is 3, that value is 5, that value is 15. We only care that they go in that order. And that could be 1, 10, 40, and 100. It's all the same. They rank the same way. And that immediately makes us robust against a bunch of outliers. So when you consider uh, the, the data I was talking about earlier, where there were a bunch of 95-year-olds in this juvenile data set, that handful of data, instead of being out at 95, where the mean is 15, those data would just be the ones at the top of the distribution. It would be like there were a bunch more 18-year-olds in that data set. It reduces the kind of leverage effect of these wild outliers. Counting things is another uh, robustifier. As soon as we just start counting stuff, uh, the law of large numbers kicks in, and everything starts to look pretty Gaussian. It's a, it's a really wonderful phenomenon. Counting, and, and, and then the third one is looking at signs, whether something's going up or going down. That becomes, and counting signs becomes really robust. Uh, zero is often a, an important number, where you know, whether, whether, whether the trend is in one direction or the other. And that direction can very often be more important than the actual rate of change. And by throwing away the rate of change, we're also throwing away all the noise in the rate of change. So the theory is, we're going to throw away information. Right? Sounds crazy. Hopefully, we will throw away more noise than signal. And this proves to be the case in a remarkable number of situations. <clears throat> there have been cases where I've applied robust algorithms, and things have not gotten better. I don't think I've ever encountered a case where I've applied robust algorithms and things have gotten worse. It's, it's a remarkably powerful set of techniques. It also has two very nice uh, consequences, one of which is really, really important, which is it reduces the need to tune parameters on our algorithms, and it often uh, re it reduces a number of parameters. And uh, because the underlying distribution of things like counting numbers have well-known distributions, signs have got well-known distributions, uh, it gives us some objective guidance as to how to tune those parameters. 
one of the things you'll find with statistical analysis in particular, and, and machine learning in general, is there's a bunch of parameters and not necessarily any great guidance on how to tune them. One of the examples given by one of the keynotes was we are like at, at the age where James Watt has just invented the, the modern steam engine. And machine learning is like this. It's the steam engine that's going to uh, uh, drive industrial development in the 21st century. And I think there's more to that analogy than maybe meets the eye. Because James Watt didn't know anything about thermodynamics. That understanding came 100 years later. And there's still a great deal of what we do, with, with deep learning in particular, where we have the tools, we have the engine, we know, we know basically how to make it run, but we don't have anything like what is required to do a detailed theoretical analysis and optimize the design in a principled way for a particular case. And robustness kind of just puts that all on the side, or at least a great deal of it, by bringing us back into a space where we understand the underlying distributions a little better. And as I said earlier, the other thing, the real payoff for robustness in the data engineering context is that it degrades gracefully as, as bad things happen, whereas parametric algorithms tend to do a little better uh, uh, in the normal case and then fall over badly when something unexpected happens. So I'm going to talk a little bit about, uh, about actual named uh, non-parametric tests or robust tests. There are a bunch of them. They all have these, almost all have these two-barreled names, Kruskal, Wallace, Mann, Whitney, Kolmogorov, um, they, uh, they also they go, by, they go by multiple names as well. The Mann, Whitney, U test is also the Wilcoxon test. Uh, I sometimes envision statisticians in the you know, 1950s and 1960s just having as their mission in life to get their name attached to a statistic, because that's how you, how you live on. Um, so the names are uninformative and, and somewhat scary, but they're, the tests themselves are at least conceptually quite simple. There's some nuance in the, in the, uh, in the application. Uh, so I'm, yeah, I'm going to talk about Kruskal-Wallis, which is like a non-parametric F-test. It measures difference in variance between distributions. Mann-Whitney U is like a student's T-test. It measures a difference in mean without worrying about whether or not things are Gaussian. I just mentioned Kendall's Tau and Spearman's Rank. Uh, because they are common cases where we're looking at two variables and asking whether or not there's an association between them. So they're a little bit like a non-parametric R-squared, and nobody should be using R-squared in the first place because it's a terrible statistic. So they're much better even parametric measures of association. So the t-test versus the Mann-Whitney U, like I said, they both basically measure the difference in means of distribution. So if you're looking at uh, you know, some, some quantities uh, where you have two different populations, you want to know whether or not the means are the same. For the t-test, uh, the statistic assumes that these, these things are Gaussian and the variances are equal, which is very frequently violated, especially in a manufacturing context, if you're looking at uh, things like quality control tests on an assembly line. Whereas the Mann-Whitney U test is quite intuitive. It, it, asks for, if you draw pairs of data from these two populations, what's the probability of one being higher than the other? And if the two really have the same mean, then you'll basically have equal probabilities of one being higher than the other. And you generate this U statistic based on that, which itself has a distribution that's independent of the underlying distribution of the data. And that's important because it means you can turn U into a p-value without knowing what the underlying distribution looks like. That's the key thing, because what you'd like is a p-value. You'd like to know, is this significant, or, or a p-value or something like it. The f-test, as I said, is, uh, well, the f-test is the, the, the parametric test. The f-test is um, looking and asking the same question about the variances of distributions. So if I have two distributions, is one fatter than the other? Is one more spread out than the other? Um, the f-test, to generate the p-value, ultimately have to assume that you have a Gaussian with different variances. And the Kruskal-Wallis test looks at the variances of the rank. So if you take two populations, um, you can just rank, you know, rank them all together uh, and then ask, is one of them more spread out than the other in the, uh, in the overall ranking, if you take the two together? It has a very nice property. They generate the statistic that has a chi-square distribution. Um, 
if the numbers are sufficiently large. Generally, uh, I should have mentioned for the Kruskal Wallace test, to, to make it easy, you need about 20 samples, which in this day and age is not hard to get. It used to be much harder. Kruskal Wallace, five samples, not hard to get. I have on occasion had clients who were biologists come to me and want to get data analysis done and tell, and I, and the first thing you ask them is, how big is your data set? And sometimes they'll say, oh, I have two samples. I have a, I have a control, control tissue and disease tissue. What can you tell me? You can actually sometimes tell them things, but not maybe what they want to hear. <laughs> um, I'm going to mention the, uh, the Kolmogorov-Smirnov test, the Kolmogorov in the Kolmogorov-Smirnov test, if, if uh, people know any information theory, is the Kolmogorov of Kolmogorov complexity uh, and, and all that, one of the, the great Russian mathematicians of the mid-20th century. And it looks at the cumulative distribution function on ranked uh, data, which is good for uh, looking at deviations from an expected distribution. I've used this for spectral analysis uh, in gamma spectroscopy. And it has a very interesting characteristic. Most robust tests are a little less sensitive than, the, than their parametric equivalents. Kolmogorov Smirnov is actually really sensitive, and it also is highly robust. So it's, it's one case. It's the kind of thing you would expect Kolmogorov to be associated with. It's just the best. Uh, it, is, uh, it, it, it doesn't come up that often as a need, but it's a, it's a really uh, good and powerful test. Where to find these at a Python conference? Um, everything and more is in SciPy stats. Uh, Man Whitney you, Kruskal Wallace, uh, Kolmogorov Shmernov, and all the parametric tests, the t-tests, the f-tests, they generally have very similar interfaces or even the same, so you can just swap uh, tests out and see the difference, which is a, a nice thing to be able to do. Um, and as you'll see from the, from the values here, there are two problem, hard problems in, in programming, cache and validation and naming. And, uh, and if you look at that list, you can see that this is not a problem in cache and validation. Uh, everything is oddly named, and it can be sometimes hard to find, but they are there, and the docs are pretty decent. Actually, the docs are really good now for, for SciPy. In practice, if you go out there and look and ask, you know, look at the, look in the web and ask, what, when should I be using a non-parametric test? You'll get a lot of stuff from data scientists and, and you know, scientists generally that say basically parametric tests work really well even when the data aren't that well behaved. And this is absolutely true. Most of the time, uh, it's hard to generate synthetic cases where uh, parametric tests really fail. Uh, it's relatively easy to find real cases, though, when you start looking at your own data, when they fail badly. Because you get this situation where, you know, I, I imagine having an alligator detector, and you, most alligators look pretty much the same. And then one in like a million has this, they're called lutectic or something, they're this really strange mix of colors. And those are the ones where your parametric algorithms will fall over. As a data scientist, it may not matter so much. When you're deploying these things into the real world, uh, when you have medical or health-related questions that are dependent on them, you would like to handle those questions uh, a, little, a little better. That's the big thing. So this is the thing. So when one moves from data science to data engineering, you don't get the opportunity to look at the data, which is a fundamental thing that is the basis of all science. This is what scientists do. We look very closely at the data, at the distributions, at even the individual cases. And that gives us a big premium on robust and fault-tolerant algorithms. That's the, that's the story. And I, I don't think that ro robust algorithms are often taught or as an afterthought in statistics classes, at least in my day, or not at all. Um, and I just, I'm basically here to spread the gospel of robustness uh, because I think it's something that we should think more about by default. They're computationally often quite expensive, but we have computational power to burn these days. Uh, so I think there's less excuse for not using them. So as I said, anytime you can count, you get the law of large numbers. The variance is equal to n, everything is Gaussian, and everything is good. The sign test, just looking at whether or not things are going up and down, is actually the oldest robust statistics we have uh, data on. 
It was used by a guy who was a contemporary of Newton's uh, back in the late 1600s. Uh, signs have a binomial distribution, and it generally has low power, but it's really robust. And in noisy data sets, it can do quite remarkable things. And I'm just going to give a little example of that, uh, which is stock picking, which is a known hard problem. Nobody knows what stocks are going to go up. And I looked at a data set from the last uh, seven years, basically one of the longest bull markets in history, uh, 1,800 and some days of data, and just asked if, stocks are, if, if there are stocks that in the past went up more frequently than expected, is that predictive of them going up more frequently in the future? I'm not asking how much they went up by, and I'm not asking even whether or not they went up over time, just from a day-to-day -day basis. If they went, tended to go up more often than you would expect day-to-day, -day, did they continue to do that over time? And this is a, just a, a very, uh -oh, very simple uh, analysis using pandas, uh, where in a pandas is, Really, if anybody's not using Pandas, you should be. Um, it is, uh, you, know, you, you can read a, C a CBS file, uh, CSV file in, um, and it does things like you want to take the difference in a time series, you just take the difference. Super easy. Uh, this is one of, one of the great things where you can build uh, a data frame from a data frame on a Boolean condition uh, where it's, it's just one line. No loops, no mucking about with internal data structures, Pandas handles all that for you. Uh, and then you can do some counting. It's very intelligent. It, it does the things that you would expect it to do. It's one of those things where, as a data scientist, it feels like it was written you know, really for people like me. Uh, and then you can do some simple things. It's got some rudimentary plotting uh, built in where you can generate a histogram and just show the histogram and, and ask the question, will there be stocks that stand out. That, that you, I've counted the days over this data set that, that particular stocks have gone up on a day-to-day -day basis, just with a one-day difference. And the answer is not so much. I love this graph because it makes all the marketing people really cringe when I show it. They say, you can't show that to people. And I'm like, I'm, I'm talking to data scientists. They'll understand. Uh, it's not pretty, but it conveys all the information we need. There's about 1,800 worth, days worth of data in, in the sample. Uh, so we expect 900-ish to be the, the average number of days that things would go up if it was just 50-50. But we know in bull markets that stocks tend to go up 60% of the time. So we would expect more like 1,200 days. And we don't get 1,200 days. On a day-to-day -day basis, stocks don't tend to go up 60% of the time. But when they do, they go up more than they go down and that accumulates over time to produce the trend that we see, the long-term trend. We do, however, see that some stocks go up more often than others. We do have a, a set out here that have a tendency in that direction. And we can ask the original question. So if we split the data in two, and we take the first 900 and some days, look at the stocks that go up more frequently, the very tail of that distribution, in those first 900 days, do more of those stocks, are, are those stocks overrepresented in the stocks that go up in the second 900 days? So that's, that's what gives us predictive power in this case. And if we look at this, and we do that, we find that there are 18 stocks at the top of the distribution with some fairly arbitrary threshold. And if we do the same thing, we have 42 stocks at the top of the distribution in the second half of the data. And seven of those are in common, whereas from randomness alone, we would expect to have one in common. If I just chose 18 at random and 42 at random and asked what the random overlap would be, I would expect to get one in common. So instead, we get seven. This is super significant. Now, I don't know. I don't think I'm going to run out here and, and get rich. There's a huge difference between something which is statistically significant and operationally actionable which is something whenever we do statistics uh, in an in a operational context is something we really have to keep in mind, that um, it's easy to get hugely significant effects. This is like you know, p equals 10 to the minus whatever. Um, but it may not be useful to actually make money. I don't know. I didn't look into it that deeply, because every time I do, it never comes to anything. <laughs> so 
However, we have, we have demonstrated this. Stocks that are more likely to go up on a daily basis in the past are significantly more likely to go up on a daily basis in the future. And yeah, it doesn't even mean that those stocks go up with, in time, with, with time. Those stocks could actually be going down, but tend to go up a little bit more frequently and then have big drops. I didn't dig into those questions. That, that can be left as an exercise for the interested student. <laughs> the final bit of the, of the talk, I just want to say, OK, well, I have, I have this significant effect now. Now let's just jump forward into machine learning and say, does this, uh, you know, can, can we do any of, any of these amazing deep learning techniques and uh, uh, get predictions out of this? By looking at the fraction of up days per month in the last 12 months and try to predict the direction uh, in the next quarter. Okay, so we're going to look three months ahead. So we're just uh, we're taking our signs as a ratio and throwing it into a neural network. <laughs> the thing I love about Keras is that it's this easy to build a deep neural network. And this is something there's not a lot of deep thought put into this network architecture because I was pretty sure what the answer would be. Um, but it is unbelievably easy to just build the network, connect it up, uh, and then train it with, uh, in this case, a stochastic gradient descent um, uh, minimizer. And looking at the accuracy on the, on the mean square error. And you just fit it with a bunch of, bunch of training data. Uh, back in the day, when we were, this is certainly, certainly before Python even, building neural networks was a huge pain. And, and Keras is just, I, I think I'm using the Theano back end here, but it could be TensorFlow and now it could be CNTK. Uh, it's a really wonderful front end to, uh, to all these powerful tools. And the initial result was this thing was 60% accurate. And wow, that sounds good. But the stock market goes up 60% of the time. <laughs> so in fact, the network optimized correctly on a quarterly basis by simply predicting it would always go up, right? And that is just a little cautionary tale on, uh, I, I, I give a, often have given a variant of this talk particularly to audiences that are very rich in students uh, learning machine learning for the first time. So this is a bit of a cautionary tale uh, for them to make sure that training classes are always represented equally in your training data regardless of what they are in the real world data. Uh, make sure that you randomly select uh, the training and, and test data. Don't, don't uh, cheat in that regard. And one of the things I, talk, I like to talk about is what I call meta overtraining, where we take a network architecture and, and we uh, train and we test. And then it doesn't work very well. So we tweak the network architecture and we train and we test on the same data. And it doesn't work very well. So we do it again, and we do it again, and we do it again. And it's very easy these days to train and test you know, hundreds of network architectures. And then one of them works well on the test data. And we say, hooray, we've solved the problem. But the significance of that test has to be divided by the number of network architectures we've run things through. It's, it's very easy to fool ourselves. And if you're a scientist, I mean, sometimes that's a publishable result, right? Um, it, it's, it's very easy. To, and we, we see this in other areas as well, where we apply just a mass of statistical tests of things. We get one that's significant, and that's the one we publish. It's very easy to fool ourselves um, when we are, when we're, when we're want badly to get a particular result. So always test and, and always be honest with the, with, the, with the training data, the test data. So in conclusion, uh, increased robustness may reduce power. In cases like kolmogorov smirnov uh, you don't actually get any power reduction. Um, and it is, uh, uh, when, when there is a power reduction, it's usually not too bad. We can very frequently, even when not using a named test, uh, get our data into a robust form, doing things like counting signs, doing things like just counting stuff. Um, and if we understand the basic distribution of, of large numbers or binomial distributions, we can use those very directly in our analysis. And finally, robustness is not a silver bullet. Even though I had a statistically significant thing there, it didn't necessarily result in any predictive payoff. So that is it. Thank you. And we have time for questions. Yep. Is it because of the 
needs of the petition problem or because you see that a lot of a lot of noise in the data that you introduce robotness? Say that again, please. So when you introduce robotness into the data, is that because of the needs of the um, petition problem or because is that because of the noise in the data? Fundamentally the noise in the data. Yeah. Yeah. It's almost yeah. always that. Yeah. Yes? It was. So, so uh, I asked, what the reason to, uh, uh, what is the motivation to introduce the openness? Is that because of the um, needs of the analysis, or because of the whether, of yeah, data? whether the motivation is is whether whether I'm motivated by the needs of the analysis or noise in the data, and generally it's noise in the data that that drives this. It's you can always you can always replace a robust analysis with a parametric analysis or vice versa. Um, there are always multiple ways of answering the same question. It's always the noise that drives the choice of the robustness. Yep. So the uh, things you covered were mostly statistical hypothesis tests. Or, yep. Uh, some sort. So let's say you wanted to add, apply this kind of methodology to uh, machine learning algorithms where you're training them. Would that just be something as simple as instead of feeding in your feature, feeding in the ranks of the feature? Yes. This is, the question was, uh, this is all statistical hypothesis testing. Um, what would one do if you were uh, just wanted to do like straight up machine learning? Um, and uh, would, you, would you just feed in robust measures like the ranks of the feature rather than the value of the feature? Uh, and the answer is yes. You would choose, you can feed things like ranks directly into um, uh, machine learning algorithms with the caveat uh, that they tend to be discrete. I mean, they are discrete in that case. Um, and that can produce uh, issues for some uh, machine learning algorithms. Something like quantiles would be better? Yeah, potentially. Yeah, or you can do things like I did with the, um, did here, I took the ratio of, of signs, for example, which is a little more continuous distribution rather than just the count, which becomes very discrete. Him first, then you. Sorry? <laughs> yes? Sampling techniques that are analogous to the um, statistical tests that are like behave nicely with the robust uh, framework. What would you mean by? Uh, I'm not sure I understand the question. Um, so instead of like doing some formula and looking up yep. tables. Oh um, yeah, are there, yeah. So the question is, are there any sampling techniques that could be applied to this? Uh, the answer is yes, absolutely. These things are all, uh, you know, 100% resampling friendly. Uh, so you can, you can basically do resampling on the ranks the same way you would do on cardinal data. Yeah. Yes? So uh, a lot of, uh, you know, the trend now is to use a deep network to yep. learn the feature instead of, yep. you know, the, the job of the analyst to construct the feature. Yep. And when you use that, most of the algorithm is use some sort of, um, you know, guardians, uh, you know. Yep. Algorithm, we could go into uh, local optimal. So yeah. what is a way to make sure that that local optimal is not very, it's, it's really good? Yeah, there's two aspects to that question. One is, I'm old, um, so I don't necessarily totally buy into the notion of using the deep learning mechanisms to extract the features. I think there's still a very significant role for human intelligence in this. Um, but I've worked mostly with smaller data sets. So as I the example I gave in, in biology, where you've got two samples, one disease, one control, uh, you can handle those cases by enhancing the human intelligence. What I did in that case was told the researcher, go away and give me, you know, do a literature review, give me a bunch of genes that you think, half a dozen genes that you think will differ between the two samples, then I'll do a numerical analysis, see which genes actually differ in their expression, and we'll look at the overlap of the lists. And if your genes are overrepresented in my list, then we know something. But that's not a deep learning problem. Um, the fundamental thing about keeping out of local optima is add noise and do it again, right? Start things from different random starting points and see whether or not they converge. That's the, the biggest deal. And it multiplies the amount of work that you have to do. I worked on a, a very complex multimodal 2D, 3D image registration problem for computer-assisted surgery um, that was a minimizer in a very noisy environment, ultimately. Uh, and the only way to make it robust was to give it multiple random starting points and, and make sure that they all converge to the same place. Yeah. 
And tweak the network architectures, too. Tweak everything. Yes? Can I have another question? So um, using, uh, or introducing openness comes with a price, right? You said that you may yeah. lose information. Yes. So how, how, do, how do you make the decision, okay, when you're going to introduce openness instead of using, for example, using Rang or, or yep. things like that, instead of using your original value? How, yep. how do you make the decision? So the question is, uh, because robustness can have consequences in terms of, of losing power, uh, how do you make the decision whether or not things need to be robust? Um, uh, taste and experience, um, <laughs> which is not a great answer. I don't have any strong. You look at the data, basically. You look at a lot of data. And you ask, are there anomalies? Are there outliers? Uh, and ideally, you, you try both and, and see which one gives you better results and, and on, a lar on the largest data set you can find. So there's a bit of trial and error. So there's one question over here that I'll take. Yep. Can you elaborate a little bit about what you mean by counting signs? Is this specific to time series data? Or, or uh, generally, yes, probably. Uh, but there are other cases where any, t any time where you have a value that might be positive or negative, um, yeah, when you, what you really need, because you're always talking about data that's attached to an entity, right? So whenever you have an entity that has multiple values associated with it, uh, in gene expression data, we're often looking for genes that are upregulated versus downregulated, right? And that's typically done uh, quantitatively with some kind of fold difference. But you could as well, when comparing, say, a, a cancer tissue sample versus normal tissue sample, simply ask, count the genes that are upregulated you know, relative to some baseline versus the genes that are downregulated. So it wouldn't be a time series, but any time you have multiple measures associated with a single entity, you can start to ask about uh, counting signs. Yeah. Yes? Yes. Sorry, there was somebody over here. Yes. I was just wondering, oh. uh, how, how would you say how, uh, how robust are Bayesian, Bayesian analysis? when it comes to outliers and data when compared to the techniques you, talk, you talked about? So the question is how robust are Bayesian uh, analyses when, when looking at these? Um, the answer is super robust in general. I am a card-carrying Bayesian. We should all be doing using Bayesian methods. Uh, this is a very conventional statistical talk because that's the language that statisticians use to talk about robustness. But basically, all of this can be cast in Bayesian language because ultimately, God created the probability distribution functions. All else is a work of man. So we can, that's what we're trying to do here, is, is get the problem into a form where we have a well-known probability distribution function that allows us to run Bayesian methods on it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so in the, in the Keras example you showed, you used a softmax and mean squared error. I'm, uh, yes? In the, in the Keras, uh, Keras code, yes. you, you showed like you used, you used uh, mean squared error and softmax. Yes. Um, I think, I, I wonder why you didn't use cross entropy. Like, oh, usually mean squared error and uh, softmax. Because I'm old. The question is, why did I use mean squared error instead of a cosine? Uh, cross entropy? Yeah. So, yeah, basically because I'm old. Because um, <laughs> in my day, we used mean squared error. Uh, but, but you're probably correct. Yeah. How would the robustness philosophy compares to regularization techniques? Say again? How would robustness approach compares to regularization? Yeah, I got, yeah. Um, regularization generally requires uh, some kind of supervening knowledge uh, where you have some idea of what things should look like. Uh, so in the cases where you have that and can apply that in a principled way, uh, it can be a very powerful technique. In the problems I've worked on mostly, we haven't had that. So the danger of regularization is that you're imposing a view on the data. And if you're wrong, um, that can result in, in uh, incorrect results. So yeah, that's the, that, so fundamentally the choice there depends on how much information you have and how much you trust it. Hey, him first. <laughs> I was just wondering if you could talk more about handling imbalanced classes. Well, one of the things, uh, I'm under the impression that um, if you resample, uh, you might be optimizing for, let's like, say, area end of curve at the expense of calibration of yep. a classifier. Uh, are, are different models uh, prone to that? Uh, or, or broadly, broadly speaking, you should, I mean, ideally, 
your, your training data, your real data, like your full data set, should have pretty equal representation of all your classes. And if you can't do that, if you're really, I mean, but some problems don't present us with that. You know, 60-40 is not bad, but I have worked in, again, in biological samples where you get three or four different cancer types and, and you know, 90% of them or more are, are, are the three and you've got this tiny little sample of the, uh, of, of, of the other one. Um, in that case, ultimately, you need more data, right? That's the correct solution. Uh, beyond that, you, uh, you have to you know, underweight somehow the, the sample that you have the least of because you've got idiosyncratic, idiosyncratic features in there. You've got, you, and, and you don't want that limiting your analysis. In some cases, you simply want to exclude the smallest class um, or break the analysis up if you've got a multi-class problem so that you do uh, that class versus everything else and then analyze the within class problem in the larger data set separately. Is yeah. that Burchef working on in that case? Is that Burchef? Say, say again? Boost chef. Boost? Yeah, bootstrapping. bootstrapping. Yeah, bootstrapping. bootstrapping, yes. Yeah, I'm not a big bootstrapping fan, but yeah. So are you? I was just uh, went, wanted to reference the question in your answer that basically re regularization kind of maps to direct invasion analysis to finding your prior, right? Yeah, if you've got a good prior, that's the, basic, that's the basic thing. If you've got a good prior, and I love to have a good prior, but I often don't, right? And yeah, so anything else or are we done? Oh, more. Sorry, him first, then you. I was going to ask about the ranking that you actually do, ranking yep. and count. Uh, is that ranking actually based on human domain knowledge? No, it's literally numerical ranking. So if I've got cardinal values that are like 1.2, 3.4, 4.5, oh. they're just Sorry. ranked. They did one, two, three. Yeah, right, yeah it's it. just replacing the cardinals with the ordinals. Yep. I was going to ask, uh, more, do you have more thoughts on uh, the difference between uh, what you call it, meta overtraining and Hyperparameter optimization. Or I, well, like, like, hyperparameter over. Oh, yeah. I mean, we can't get away with it. Okay, we can't get away from it rather because we've got a finite amount of data. Um, but hyperparameter optimization ultimately reduces the statistical significance of our final result, right? And then we have so we if you if do what I like to do really is the way we do if you've got enough data, which mostly these days we do. Take a big block of data and make that your training set. Hyperparameter optimize like mad on that. But then, once you've done that, use that other chunk as a true training set for your optimized, or test set, rather, for your optimized network. That's the thing you do. Because otherwise, the internal, and I've seen papers published that are basically worthless <laughs> because what they've done is tuned up the network until they happen to get a good result on the, training, on the test set but it's not robust. It doesn't carry over to ultimate, um, to, to, to general data. So you're saying have a, valid, have a training validation and test set? Yes. Okay. Yes. So, yeah. 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 It is 4 o'clock, and I think it's time to go home. Thank you very much. <laughs>